So, Dad, mm -hmm. I'm starting a podcast with a friend of mine. What's that? Uh, it's basically like a radio show, but it's okay. on the internet. Okay. Make sure that uh, that program doesn't contain controversial subjects. And uh, you're not impolite to people. No, oh, definitely not, Dad. You know me. I'm never, <laughs> ever controversial or yeah, impolite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you don't really believe me, do you? Oh, yeah. You don't. <laughs> Welcome to Polite Conversations with Ina and Paul. We promise this to be a place where there will be nothing controversial ever discussed by anyone about anything. Sex? Nope. Politics? Definitely not. Religion? Are you kidding me? You get a female ex-Muslim together who happens to be a minority with a white ex-military ex-Christian American male and watch the magic happen. Polite Conversations with Ina and Paul. Welcome to the conversation. Hey listeners and welcome to Polite Conversations with Paul and Ina. Just a quick introduction before we get over to Alia Salim and our incredible chat with her. You're going to love what she has to say. We're still looking for a home for Polite Conversations. There will be more news to come on that. As many of you realize, every effort to upload these videos to YouTube where we wanted the world to be able to hear it has been met with resistance. We're not really sure what's going on. We have a few people looking to help us. And hopefully, sometime in the near future, we will have a more stable home, a dedicated home for this show, because we know it's important. There just seem to be some roadblocks that we keep running into, and I have a sneaking suspicion it's because there are people who don't necessarily want Ina's voice to be heard. We're going to keep working that. We do appreciate all of the support out there in the social media realm. Uh, the Twitter support has been incredible, helping us try to get the attention that we need from YouTube to stop blocking the channel so we can actually get this uploaded. Thank you for subscribing to the SoundCloud or to the Q's RSS feed so that we can actually get these episodes out to you on a regular basis. Again, more information will be coming when it's available and when we have a clear idea of how we're going to approach this in the future. Before we get into the interview, just real quick, I wanted to mention that the recording was done on Raif Badawi's birthday. I wanted to send my personal thoughts out to Raif and his wife, Ensof. I hope everything is as well as can be expected, and I hope we get to hear some encouraging news very, very soon. Now let's get over to the interview. Welcome to episode two of Polite Conversations with Ina and Paul. Today, we'll be speaking to Alia Salim, ex-Muslim activist and co-founder of Faith to Faithless, an organization that offers support and raises awareness for apostates of all backgrounds. Alia also has a fantastic video for those looking to take off the hijab and challenges that come with it. We'll link to all these things in the show notes. Hi, Alia. Hi, so thank you for inviting me on this uh, new podcast of yours. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much for coming on. I hope that you don't get us banned from YouTube again. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt it. That's not going to happen. Let's hope not. But, I mean, our first episode was thrown off. I don't know. I kind of want to keep the uh, streak going, you know. I know I want to keep the streak going for sure. You want to try, <laughs> yeah, try and get banned for every episode? <laughs> Yeah, you should definitely put it. I mean, do, have you put that one back up again? I mean, I, I, I shared it like mad. Yeah. Because I was just so outraged. I was just so, I couldn't believe that it, it, it was, you know, censored that way so quickly as well. And that's actually, you know, the best counter to these things. They try to censor you and then more and more people share it. Even Dawkins shared it, well, thanks to you, yeah. which was <laughs> great. And then more people heard it than probably would have heard it if it wasn't banned. So I don't see the point in trying to silence opponents in this way. Exactly. exactly. But yeah, so we're here to talk to you today about uh, a few things. My first question, mm -hmm. I want to talk to you about Al-Huda. This is uh, okay. 
<laughs> my favorite educational institute. Um, so yeah, it's mine too. <laughs> yeah, it's basically an Islamic uh, educational institute for women, right? Yeah, it is, and yeah. it's the same one that uh, the San Bernardino shooter Tashfin Malik was a part yeah. of as well. So, yeah. can you tell me a bit about how you got started there? Was it family pressure, or was it something you wanted mm. to do yourself? Was it friends? Well, I mean, uh, I have quite a I have quite a, a, a complicated relationship with Al Huda because um, I went to an Islamic boarding school in Britain from the age of about eleven to fifteen. And when I left, well, when I was thrown out of high school for having a camera, um, you know, I already had uh, a family member who, who had already been to Al Huda and who said it was brilliant. So when I left school, the, you know, the first point of contact, you know, my parents were like, yeah, you know, why don't you go to this school um, in Pakistan? Well, actually, originally I went to Canada. Um, so I was really excited about, you know, getting out of Britain, traveling, moving away and, and going to this school. So I went to Canada for about two months. Um, and when I was there, that doctor, you know, Dr. Farah Hashmi, so she runs this school and the school is essentially her. You know, she's the one who's written all of the tafsir, which is the interpretation of the Quran. The, the, the course content is by her. The very hard so line it, course content. It's very, yeah, it's very hard line. But, you know, for me... At the time, I didn't realize that it was hardline because I had already grown up around such conservative religious forms in my life that it wasn't so, it, it didn't feel extremist. It, it, it felt normal. So is it your family that it has always like kind of been into this uh, type no, of? It's, no, it's really bizarre actually because my family is not that religious. I mean, my, um, my siblings are quite liberal Muslims and my father's always been quite liberal, kind of bordering on skeptical, hmm. but he's still Muslim. My mother is very conservative, but she's one of those, you know, you know, gets along with the Sufis, gets along with the Brelvis, gets along with all the different types, you know, doesn't have a problem with the Shias. And the reason why my mom sent me to the school was sort of as an experiment. You know, loads of, I mean, when I originally first went to an Islamic school at the age of 11, it was something that was becoming very prominent. A lot of family members were sending their kids. You know, my mom, she heard about it. She knew she couldn't afford to send me to a proper private school, but she could afford this one. And she wanted to sort of give it a go. And, you know, the school had really good grades online, you know, according to Ofsted. So there's nothing to stop her from sending me there. And, you know, she's religious. So for her, a religious school is good for you. You know, that's just the way that she, that's the way that she thought. So the funny thing is that when I became really, really religious, like after Al Huda, it was so different to anything that my family had ever practiced. I was probably the most extreme person mm -hmm. in the family. Um, and I don't think anyone else in my family has really gone down that route because nobody else, you know, other than, you know, one family member has really been in any form of, of religious education. And that's something I've seen with a couple of Al Huda members. Uh, I mean, I have a relative as well that goes there, and the change I've seen in her has been astounding, really. She's become yeah. more I'm extreme than anyone else, and, you know, she's kind of uh, preachy towards her parents who aren't religious enough for her yeah. anymore. I mean, that's what's really interesting about it is because what Al Huda does is it makes you feel like you are taking up a mantle. Mm -hmm. You know, you have luckily found yourself in this incredible place and now you're going to learn what it means to to really know Islam. And what and, and the reason why I think it's been so successful among middle class Pakistani women is because Al Huda is run by a woman who tells you that it's, you know, you are given the power to choose how to, you know, how religious to be. Because the thing about Al-Hadar is, you know, you know, even when I was out there, if you didn't want to do something, if you didn't want to pray, they weren't going to give you a punishment for it. They'd make you feel bad about it. I mean, I grew up in a religious school in Britain where I was given punishments for not praying or, you know, you know, you would be thrown out of class for challenging. Al-Hadar Al wasn't exactly like that, okay. you see. So it was a bit but, softer, but more manipulative? It, yeah, yeah. That's it. It, it was it's much more emotionally manipulative. Mm -hmm. um, and because the thing about Farah Hashmi is, 
she is this exceptionally revered woman. I can't stress how how revered she is. Uh, so I hear. I mean, I see. I seen her give a talk on TV, and she's in a full niqab. And yeah. I, I just I, wonder why she bothers going on TV with, you know, <laughs> like just do radio. <laughs> You're, well, you're not being about, nice um, now, Ina. <laughs> Pardon? I said you're not being nice now. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's not someone I. I know. I figured. Love, but. Oh, she's not my best friend either. But <laughs> the thing about about um, about Farah Hashmi is that she does have this very conservative, um, you know, form of Islam, and some people could argue that it's Islamist, and some could argue that it's not. But you know. She she does sort of preach this you know this this obedience of women you know towards their husbands. I mean, for instance, if you go online and you search Al Huda Tafsir, which is I'll say I'll explain it again. Tafsir is the interpretation of the Quran, so what it means and you know etc. If you go to her one about you know the the, the wife be in verse, they do say that it is a form of physical hit even if it's a light hit so al huda doesn't even take the viewpoint that it's symbolic if they were even going to be nice about it mm-hmm. you see so she's very conservative and a lot of uh, what it is with especially with you know the one year course is it's so intensive and it's every single day and it's so emotional the women who who you know the, the women who teach are so into it and you know you just get sucked into this you know this this, this kind of chaos of 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 religious fervor this you, you know i went to i went to al huda at 15 16 rebellious i'd been thrown out of school i'd always challenged my teachers hate wearing hijab i was pretty much like a goth emo skater kid mm. and i ended up in this in this religious school in pakistan and after about six months i was i was in a niqab that i put on myself wow, wow. i mean does that, does that just testament to her uh, ability to manipulate people right well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's the entire, I mean, yeah, it's the entire system. And I think also, you know, it's in somewhere like Pakistan, um, you know, women are so heavily controlled in what they do, how they think and what they wear, etc. al our women tend to become very independent because they feel that Islam gives them the power to make up their minds. So often they go against their families, which is the first time they rebel yeah, against seen their family. You so they rebel I mean? into becoming more religious. They rebel against husbands exactly. into putting the headscarf on, into covering their Into face. putting the niqab, exactly. It's and, and that's what's so it, it's such a it's a really bizarre thing. And you know, when I was in Pakistan, you need the women that used to go there, you know, I mean, very, very wealthy women, very nice women. And, you know, it was almost like lots of tea parties, you know, it's just you need to go to their house and they'd have all these, you know, kind of set up. Um, yeah, it was an it was an interesting time, actually, because, you know, sometimes I look back and I don't know how it happened to me. You know, how how did I go from a bolshe rebellious girl to this person who would walk around really quietly, who would get into arguments with people because they weren't practicing Islam properly. I used to pray six times a day. I, you and know. that's another thing. <laughs> the sign is <laughs> when people go above and beyond what's required, that to me yeah. doesn't seem culty because it's only five prayers that are supposedly required a yeah, day. Okay, an extra if you're praying one. <laughs> an extra one, or if you know the face veil is not really required or explicitly mentioned in the Quran, but if you see women in the face veil or black gloves but and black socks, al according to al Huda, the face veil is compulsory. Is it? Yeah, according How did they to justify I mean, we that. Because I don't see a verse well, talking say, about the face well, there is, well, there is a verse. Oh, I wish I had it on me. But it, it speaks about um, like jalabib, which are cloths. And yeah, the question says, is like, whether it means lift over. Cloth. Yeah, it's, it's whether it's over or around. Ah, okay. Is, is it around your body or is it over your head? Okay. So. And they take it to mean over. And I mean, for instance, I mean, when... When we were there, I mean, obviously they would say to us, you know, you know, our teacher, you know, was because um, remember, because when I went to Al-Hudar, Farah Hashmi was in Canada 
and I was in Pakistan and I was actually in, in, in Canada, they were doing the Urdu course. And the reason why I left it was because when I went to Canada, they had already start the, started the course. It was halfway through and I couldn't understand Urdu very well. But an English translated course was starting in Pakistan. And that's, yeah, that's why I went so to Pakistan. Strange <laughs> that they didn't have an English course in Canada, and when you went to Pakistan, they gave you an English course. Yeah, I know. I feel like my whole life is upside down. <laughs> but that's actually what happened. So that's why I ended up leaving Canada, which was so amazing. I loved it there, and going to Pakistan because they just started this this English course, and the woman who was teaching it, um, she literally read Farah Hashmi's lectures word for word. Mm. you know what I mean so you, you can go online her, her lectures are there so what, what so what people are essentially doing is repeating her understanding of Islam mm-hmm. in all these different centers and that's why in a way the model works so well because she's yeah. done the groundwork it's a very like structured <coughs> institute uh, you know yeah. for women it's not common to have those in Islam so no, I, I was, right at this scale, especially. This I'm is curious like, about how that that process. As a Western male, never been a Muslim kind of guy. One of the things that I always took away from my interviews with ex-Muslims was the uh, communal influence, especially on women, to conform. When you were in the school, did they stress? Because you you mentioned earlier about you know, the, the individuality and it, and it women or mm-hmm. the girl students were, could leverage that to rebel against their parents, et cetera, et cetera. So in that school, part of the, um, the curriculum, did they really, did they focus on a, a child's individualism or was it more like a community mm-hmm. over individual? No, it, it, the thing is, is that, you know, Pakistani society is, is very much about, um, you know, that, that the community is more important than the individual. Mm-hmm. But what al Huda teaches is that religion and God is more important than the community and the family. So just because your parents tell you that you can't do something which Islam tells you to do, doesn't mean that you have to listen to your parents, mm. you see. And that's where, in a way, that's why, in a way, a lot of women who go to al Huda do have a really difficult time with their families because they become so religious but their families don't necessarily want to conform. And the thing about al Hudar is it has a very, it, 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 they teach you to become inva- evangelical about it, that you actually have to go out there and preach it. So one of the things that al Hudar does is it tells you once you complete the course, you are ready to teach the course to other people, to go back to your country and start a little school and do it. Mm. You Can see? you start and, it like as a franchise or do you have to do it under your own name? No, you can start it as a franchise, so you can go like essentially. So you can like, profit you know, off of their name. Like, do you? Pay I don't know them about profiting. No, no, no. It's, it's it's very kind of, it's very kind of volunteer based. I mean, we do. There is an Al Hudar school in London, which I don't know that much about, apart from the fact that they did purchase a um, a building that used to belong to the Metropolitan Police. There was a report about it. Um, but for instance, the way that it, you know, the way that they kind of encourage you to do it is you have al Hudar schools, which are institutional. They are part of the al Hudar franchise, but they tell you that you have the power and the capacity to essentially start your own classes. So if I give you an example, <coughs> sorry, when I was at college doing my A-levels, and when I mean college, I mean between um, high school and university, mm-hmm. I started teaching the al Hudar course in my um, in the prayer room of the college that I went to. But you didn't charge it, for it? No, 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 it was free. But the official, like, one-year courses, people have to pay money for it, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to pay for it. So then there's only, like, certain recognized branches that can actually yes. profit off yeah. of it? Absolutely, okay. yeah. So then they're just could, yeah. taking advantage of other people to just go and spread the word for free while they... Well, well, yeah, I mean, obviously you can look at it that way, but I think I think for al Huda and I think for Hashmi, you know, she is she is a very religious woman. You know, you can call her an extremist or not, but, you know, she, that is what makes al Huda very different to a lot of different religious organizations is that she essentially says that women have the power to educate other women. 
And she does certain things that other Islamic schools would absolutely despise. For instance, um, Hashimi says that women should lead other women in prayer. So there's like a weird... A weird kind of empowerment <laughs> yeah. thing going on and, there, and that, and and this is why when I when I went to Al Huda for the first time, I really liked that. that. I mean, that was what I think drew me in. Was yeah, the, I can see that the fact that you know, you know, because I could, I, cause I'd come from an environment where you know, I, I I think I had an upbringing that was quite different to most people, especially living in a Western country, but then growing up in such a religious school that was so repressive. So on the one hand, they're, you know, about this <coughs> women's empowerment where you can lead the prayers, which you're not supposed to do by many traditional interpretations or whatever. Exactly. But then on and the other public, hand, oh. they're saying the the wife beating verse in the Quran is actually, you know, they take the harder stance on it where they say it's actually yeah. physical beating and not just symbolic. So, you know, yeah. how does one make sense of these two aspects? Okay. I mean, that's... Uh, I think because with the thing about Islam is Islam has bizarre notions on women and female empowerment. You know, some you know, especially the more conservative forms of Islam have very bizarre notions on female empowerment. Um, and the, this idea that things are done in Islam for 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 women's own own good. So, for example, wearing a veil or you know you know a certain law that's put into place for women is for their own good. And in a way. You know, her telling women that they're allowed to lead prayer for each other or they're allowed to, to you know, to have that ownership that they're able to teach each other. She, it, it essentially feels like she's saying that, you know, it, it, it feels like she's taking it out of the hands of male scholars. But it's Which, not really going yeah. that far. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And, you know, she said things like, you know, that you have to obey your husband. She's, she's hardly a feminist. Yeah. That's yeah. That's what I'm having trouble understanding. Like, I feel like it's like a tool to draw people in, but it's really just on the surface. I think so. I I think I think on the surface it looks very much like female empowerment, and I think it took me a little while to get my head around it. Um, because you know, I left Islam after I went to Al Huda. Um, it had been like a year and a half after I left Al Huda, and it's taken me a long time to actually be able to look back at my childhood and to look at my life and understand what had happened, what these people were saying to me, what it meant, and to and and to understand that. So for instance, the first time that I ever spoke about Lodar in public, you know, I didn't really say anything bad about it because I think, you know, it it is hard to have been so attached to a school like that and then to actually challenge it in such in, in such a public way. And and I don't know that a lot, there are a lot of the um, former students are so attached to this school. In Al in Al Huda, and it's because it takes so much. You know, they get so emotionally involved in that process of of becoming really religious. Mm -hmm. You know, but it doesn't. I don't think it lasts for everyone. I mean, I have seen plenty of Al, Al Huda students who have gone from quite liberal to very conservative, back to liberal again. Once they've kind of, you know, there's no steam left. Mm -hmm. Because after that whole process of, you know, being being zealous and getting really, really into it, I think it's quite an emotionally draining experience. Well, it, it was for me anyway. And that's what kind of what I wanted to ask you about was the adjustments, but you kind of hit on that. So I want to kind of ask you a question, and I would love to kind of tap into the affective side of your thoughts. When, when you have had an experience like that, or your classmates, people that you know who have gone through that experience, one of my problems is... You know, as a white Western male, we're so far removed from that experience that it's really just even listening to you now, it's very difficult for me to try to even relate to that experience. And I can feel my brain going a thousand miles an hour while you're you're explaining it because it just seems so surreal to me to be in a situation mm -hmm. like that and then be able to come out of that and be a, you know, a healthy, functioning, rational member of, contributing mm -hmm. member of society. I mean, I got to praise you for that. So when I, and, and it takes a lot of effort on my part, not everybody in my demographic mm -hmm. is going to give you that benefit of the doubt or, you know, your former peers, your former classmates. So on an mm -hmm. affective side or level, um, when you see things like the, the shooting in California and you see mm -hmm. the natural progression of the conversation 
f- start mm-hmm. focusing on you know her background and what she was exposed to and then there's that inevitable mm-hmm. link to islam and then the bigotry mm-hmm. comes out on uh, for you as, yeah. a, as a person and the people that you loved and cared about who are your classmates what does it what does it feel like to know to for you because it's such a unique perspective to have lived through that and to have come out of it and, and probably processed a lot of stuff. And then just to see something like this happen in, in the mental, just the mental midget mentality that some folks have to point the finger at everybody who's got brown skin and is a Muslim and go, bam, see? Mm-hmm. So what does that feel like for you uh, so that our listeners can understand that in order to be good allies with ex-Muslims, to be to help mm. be champion, help champion their efforts, that we need to actually understand the impact of when some person will will make those bigoted, short-sighted, you know, vitriolic comments. Mm. I think. I mean, I do. I do understand what you mean when you say, you know, as a Western male who's never really been through that before. But I, I, I think you have to break that down a little, a little bit because the experiences that I've had of of being heavily indoctrinated and then finding myself in a position where I'm being seduced by a form of extremism um, is something that happens in so many different cultures and different contexts. And it happens within the white American context as well. Mm-hmm. So for instance, you know, if you have a poor American guy who grows up in, in an area and then he gets seduced by neo-Nazi propaganda that's going to make him dehumanize a black person to the point where he doesn't even see that person anymore. Mm-hmm. That is, and, and then getting out of that is also, I think, is an experience that I think I could understand as well because I was anti-Semitic and I was homophobic. And I did blame Israel for everything. And that was the kind of person that I was. And I'm ashamed of it. So I think that this being able to be seduced by by extremism is a is a human it's a human problem. And I think that's something that those people who, you know, would look at Muslims and think that, you know, Islam is this thing that's almost like a virus. You know, it's almost like it's under your skin. Right. Once you're born a Muslim, it's like that's what you are and you're going to be seduced by it because you're you're brown almost. And I think that's why in a way when I get, you know, when I meet or when I speak to atheists that, you know, say things like, you know, Islam is a disease or Islam is the problem or hashtag the religion of peace. Mm-hmm. I don't have a problem with that. They're more than welcome to do that. But. Sometimes it can be symptomatic of an obvious ignorance. Right. And and the obvious ignorance, in my opinion, right, is that Islam is a huge religion. And the, we have got so many bad parts of that religion. And, you know, I would never, ever deny, and I'm not an apologist for Islam. But I think what a lot of, you know, non-Muslim people, never Muslims, fail to recognize is that there are so many Muslims from within that who who are affected by extremism and they are affected in 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 the way that ex-Muslims are affected Mm -hmm. so for instance we ex-Muslims are I suppose on one side of the spectrum I've always said the reason why it's so important to make sure that (laughs) ex-Muslims and their rights are protected is because by allowing the person who's actually, you know, blaspheming from a Muslim heritage to do it and get away with it, opens up a huge space for everyone else. Mm-hmm. Right. You see what I mean? And I mean, that process of of, of, of coming out of extremism was actually um, not that difficult, almost. I think a lot of people say, oh, you know, it must have been really hard for you. But actually what it what it did for me was it allowed me to get rid of shackles that I'd been trying to get rid of, of all my life. Okay. You know, once I had been pushed to a religious edge that was so far, where I was policing myself, for me to be able to actually get out of there, it allowed me to actually have complete control over my life. And there's a lot of, there are a lot of Muslims out there, a lot of ex-Muslims, liberal Muslims, humanists, whatever, like, I don't, I don't really care about labels that much, who... They are trying. I mean, I don't know if you have you ever heard of Karima Banun? I know. No. So Karima Banun, uh, she works for the UN. I don't know her exact title, but I do really respect her. And she wrote a book called "Your Fatwa Does Not Apply Here." 
I read I've heard and, of that book. Yeah, it is brilliant. And if you don't, you know, I, I, and I would recommend anybody who, you know, is listening to this, if you don't want to read the book because it's long, you're more than welcome to just look, you know, her up on YouTube. And she has done this entire talk about all these different, you know, Muslims and atheists of Muslim heritage that have challenged extremism and, and, and they've been murdered for it. Mm-hmm. And naturally, if you're an atheist and you're not from within the Muslim community and you see all these horrific things happening in the name of Islam, naturally, you're going to say Islam is the problem. Right. And I understand that. Right. I do. But, they but fail I do to, think it's more complicated than yeah, that. Yeah, they fail to recognize the diversity within Islam. Yeah, absolutely. Islam has plenty of problems, but... Plenty. It, That's why I'm not a Muslim anymore. You right. Know? If I thought it was so great, I, I would have stayed. Yeah, and, and and that's why it's shocking when people call ex-Muslims who speak out against anti-Muslim bigotry like apologists or secret Islamists, <laughs> yeah. right? Because it's like, why yeah. would I risk my life to leave a religion that I'm an apologist for? But no, I'm absolutely against bigotry still. I left religion because I was against yeah. bigotry, so I'm not going to tolerate it outside of religion. And, and, and so, I mean, and, and I mean, the thing about ex- I mean, the thing about extremism and islam is that obviously i i do personally believe that if you have islamic fundamentalism or islamic extremism of course islam is part of the problem like i'm not one of those people that actually genuinely believes that it's got nothing to do with religion yeah that's of course it has a of course sorry. it has something to do with religion yeah but i mean this is something that i, I mentioned in, in in a piece that i wrote recently for the times where I said that with Tefshin, you know, because, you know, I, I have thought about it for the last two, three years, you know, really, really, really pondered about it, especially when British girls started going to Syria, because it really hurt me. Just the idea, of, you know, there's this one specific woman whose little sister went to Syria. And Someone every you know? time... No, 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 not just just to just his lady, you know, her poor her sister. Well, it's one of the three Bethnal Green girls. They were she, high school students who basically all together went to to Syria, mm-hmm. and they were underage. Um, so they were under eighteen. And one of the sisters, every time I see her on telly, I cry because she, you can just tell she's completely broken. Mm-hmm. And I and I've thought about this, and and on, on what I believe is obviously there's so many factors, but when you have a literalist form of Islam, which is exceptionally conservative. Then you have a geopolitical, you know, you know, factors going on. You have, you have a group that is, is citing the same verses, the same hadiths, the same narrations, and they're doing everything that your conservative religion told you is better in a different society at a different time. Mm-hmm. And then you have the personal impulsiveness of wanting to get up and leave your country, or the personal desire to actually, you know, take that risk you bring those three things together, you probably could end up with some violence. Yeah, yeah so yeah. then uh, I, is it a shock to you that the San Bernardino shooter, <coughs> Kashfin, was an al no. student? It's not a shock. No. It's not a shock. Yeah. You know, you have ISIS doing this, this, this call to Muslims everywhere. Right, but ISIS seems like, to the average Muslim, something so far off from reality. Uh, yeah, but are they really that far off to somebody who... No, they're probably not. Yeah. But, I mean, to e- everyone that I know... Um, well, yeah, to the... Yeah, of course, of course, to the to, to the ordinary Muslim. Exactly. So who, then, but, but this is why this is why I mentioned before that in then, order to actually be brought in, you need to have an extremely literalist or a very conservative of Islam under your belt in the first place. But that's what's dangerous about Al-Huda, right? Because it doesn't seem that right. far off because it's not a crazy <laughs> organization or group that's beheading people and making YouTube no. videos. It's something that's it's really accessible like, uh, to the average exactly. woman. Exactly. And it lays down that, that I see, I think, I think what it is, is that it causes that, that, that ideological ambivalence, that, that confusion. You know, if you're being taught by a teacher in a safe environment, that it's okay to, you know, that homosexuality is something that is so bad that in a Sharia state, a gay person would be killed. And we didn't, you know, there's all these narrations about how, you know, we did we, we didn't know what to do with a homosexual. So some of us killed him this way. Some of us threw him off a building. And you know, the first time that I ever saw ISIS 
throw a person who for being gay off a building or off a high place I spent two three days in shock because I studied that I studied that narration and then to see it happen Mm -hmm. it it, it was it was this immense feeling of it's like it's like it's familiar but it's not it's like you know it's familiar because you learn about it in an academic space but then when it happens it looks wrong it feels wrong and it felt wrong to me but I mean, to me, it's it's just shocking that it's taught in an academic space at all. At all. Like, yeah. I've I've grown up in a very liberal Muslim family, so I've had nothing to do with these interpretations, and I've actually learned more about Islam after leaving it uh, because. Uh, I mean, I would, my family never put importance on these things, prayer or yeah. scripture or whatever. So I grew up oblivious to a lot of it. Um, mm. But I can imagine if I had grown up with these types of interpretations that it would be a bit normalized at reading something in a book about throwing gay people off a building. But because or, I haven't, um, it's so shocking. I just, I cannot even imagine, like, I don't know. I might go to the cops if I saw that being taught to me somewhere. Well, I mean, the 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 the, the funny thing is, like, you know, when it comes to you know religious schools in, in in Britain, for instance. I mean, when I was I was going through one of my old textbooks that I was studying when I was in Britain, and I found. I mean, I left school at fifteen. Remember, so anything that I learned there was under the age of fifteen, mm-hmm. and I came across the hadith. You know, the saying of Muhammad, the one which says, "Whoever leaves his religion, kill him." Mm-hmm. I found it because I had actually written translation around it. So that means that I had studied that so within that Britain. One, in that school. And I'd forgotten, I had forgotten all about it, you see, because I, you know, I went and picked up these books from the other house, you know, recently, and I forgot all about these these old books of mine. And, I, and I'd even forgotten that I had learned that, learned this saying, but I obviously had been. I obviously had, I had, I, I had learned it. And that's why it, it is important that, you know, people seriously start challenging these scriptures because they're not they're not challenged enough it's so important i mean and that's the difference between hating (coughs) all muslims and challenging the ideology right like every single muslim isn't even aware of these exactly no they don't they they, they don't how can you blame them then if they don't even know that it's there and they're (laughs) born into a religion i can't blame them uh i mean they should know better and look up what they're pledging allegiance to but they don't a lot of religious moderates i don't don't know i think i I think in a way i think in the next i think i have noticed a lot more with people that you know people are becoming a little bit more aware and i think in a way isis has has done that and Mm -hmm. has done that in a way that i mean you know armin elwood she's the american um yeah i don't think she likes me very much at all that's (laughs) that's fine (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> she said something interesting about ISIS, which was that in a way they're a wake up call for women, right? Mm-hmm. Because of what they do. But realistically, you know, you shouldn't have waited for this level of extremism. No, <laughs> exactly. I mean, we've, it's been pretty bad for a long time. It's been bad for a um, very long time. Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's, it, it is a complicated thing. And I think personally, I feel that this kind of conversation to to challenge ideas to, to challenge you know scripture it's not only going to come from muslims because because for a very long time you know muslims have said that you know this is our religion hands off mm-hmm. if you've left islam you're not allowed to talk about it anymore and i think that's nonsense because obviously we've got, yeah. obviously we had to be part of the conversation how can they just kick the skeptics out that's ridiculous yeah you can't just have everything that's insecurity. Exactly. Well, it is insecurity. Preservation, too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Either we'll kill you if you leave, or we'll just say that you're not allowed to talk about it, at the very least. This way we'll keep it nice in a bubble, and no one challenges mm-hmm. it. But, I mean, it's so short-sighted, too, because if Muslims and people from within the Muslim community are not going to challenge it, not going to critique it in terms of modernity, then it's left up to, you know, outsiders to do. Right. And sometimes that's not the most nuanced uh, perspective. 
So yeah. we can't really complain then if people that don't know much about it are saying it's awful because we don't, mm-hmm. you know, our community refuses to criticize it in any way. Right. I mean, that's I mean, and that, that's the interesting thing as well. I mean, even with the whole ex-Muslim thing, right, about, you know, ex-Muslims and, you know, their relationship with their parents and everyone assumed that all ex-Muslims are, you know, murdered or that, you know, were all disowned or something. I think a lot of people, they look in, there's so many taboos that stop us from from being able to to speak about our struggles and, and who we are and our relationships with our families and, and how complicated we are as a people. Mm-hmm. And I say that knowing that there are many, many different types of us. I think people look in and, and, and they don't know what to think. They think that, you know, Muslim parents are kind of monstrous people that, you know, put well, their goals into... You know liberal I mean? but, media just aids that perspective, that that view of Muslims as well, by only showing like very religious Muslims as true Muslims. Well, that's it. Or censoring. I mean, you, did you see recently what um, the BBC did with the ex-Muslim hashtag? Yes, yes, I heard that, and it was disappointing. It was disappointing. To be fair, I did find it. I did find it very upsetting. Okay, so help help me out then with the with the message because we're you know we're talking about you, yeah. you, I mean you had some great points even relating your experience back to like uh, you know what someone who may be indoctrinated exposed to neo Nazism would kind of yeah. maybe possibly go through so as someone who desires to be an ally from my yeah. perspective and leverage whatever I've got at my disposal what what do I say yeah. in my messages how can I effectively communicate when when I see these things happening in the world, and I don't want to say anything, I don't want to throw a verbal va- bomb and say something stupid that would, mm-hmm. you know, kind of kind of push myself away from being a potential ally to an ex-Muslim or an apostate. What do what could we yeah. do better on our end? I mean, I think I think obviously the one thing is don't speak for us. I think it's very easy to look at ex-Muslims and say, oh well, they're all in the closet, so you know we don't, you know we have to do it because no one's speaking, right? Mm-hmm. But that's very different to actually when you have an ex-Muslim who's who's speaking, don't speak over them or try to tell them what their experience is or tell them. For example, I had a conversation with a guy on Facebook, or no, not Facebook, Twitter, and he essentially told me that because, you know, I have a, a somewhat good relationship with my parents and, and he told me that, you know, I have Stockholm Syndrome Oh, wow. Because, you know, you know, because my parents have put me through all this religious education. And I know for a fact that, you know, me speaking about my parents or me being sent to these religious schools, people are going to point the par- the finger at my parents. And my parents are fully aware of it. They know I'm public. They know that people are pointing the finger at, at me, you know, at them. But because they love me and because they've accepted who I am. They, they, they've kind of let it go. They've taken it on the chin, right? Right. So I didn't appreciate, obviously, him telling me that we have, you know, that I have Stockholm Syndrome or, you know, just telling me that, you know, explaining what my, explaining my experience back to me. So that's the first thing, you know, listen more, have more conversations and, you know, for, for kind of, you know, why atheist organizations to give more platform to different types of ex-Muslims, you know, get them, you know, get, get them involved in their conversation more and to give them that power, you know, to, to be able to say their side and to be able to to be part of that, that, that important that important conversation. And and naturally, you know, if you know an ex Muslim, if you know that there are ex Muslim organizations out there or religious organizations that deal with it, if you know you don't want to do anything political, of course there's always the issue of, you know, donating or you know donating your time. I mean, I run an organization called Faith to Faithless with my colleague Imtiaz Shams. And, you know, we we receive emails from people saying, Oh, you know, I can't really do anything but i'd be happy to volunteer you know a day or two here right. or there so i think getting involved in the movement really kind of seeing that there is a movement it is happening is is something that you know would be immensely helpful but not having people tell us and to demonize our communities further and to say you know all muslims are x y and z because no they're not and you definitely don't know what all Muslims are like, right? Because right. you're not, you know what I mean. Like we, we, we are complicated. Yeah, we have some pretty bad attitudes in our communities, but you know, point me out one type of people that don't. 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Bad habits. <laughs> well, and, you know and I've, got a, I mean? I've got a second part to that that you, you kind of made me think of it when you were talking there. So I've got, I will share this episode. We'll, we'll put it on our YouTube, but I'll also share it on my podcast feed as well. And I still have a mm-hmm. lot of ex-Muslims that l- follow that feed. And, you know, I get tons of downloads uh, in, you know, the Middle East and whatnot. So one thing yeah. I would love to hear your perspective on to maybe send back their way. I, and I'll, I'll t- share a, sh- a quick story with you because you made me think about it while you were talking. When I went to Imagine No Religion in Vancouver, Canada last year, uh, Mary what was Namaz- that, sorry? Uh, Imagine No Religion. It was a, a secular conference. <laughs> And when, oh, right, okay. and when I went there last year, you know, they had, it was three days of speakers and, and whatnot. And everybody had a lot of interaction with the, with the group of 500 people. And Miriam yeah. Namazi spoke there as well as Faisal Saeed Al-Mutar spoke. And one, one of the things I took away, and this could be just my view of the world, my perspective, my filters, you know, influencing the way I saw what happened. But I noticed during Miriam and Faisal's speeches afterwards, they had a couple questions, but the, the number of questions that they had did not even closely compare to what the other speakers who are, you know, white, North American, male, female, but they weren't from an ex-Muslim uh, perspective. Mm-hmm. So I know that I, until I started doing interview after interview after interview with ex-Muslims, I felt really uncomfortable talking even with, someone who had left Islam, I felt uncomfortable asking questions because I'd been conditioned by the world around me. And, you know, I, I like, like ex-Muslims had to be treated with kid gloves or something. So I wonder if a mm-hmm. lot of people share my timidity to approach an ex-Muslim and just be inquisitive. What, in your opinion, I, I know I'm totally putting you on the spot here, but what mm-hmm. could now flip in that paradigm? What could people who have left Islam, what could they do better in order to make, you know, me feel safer and more comfortable to ask them about their experience and to and to hear them in a way that I know I'm not going to, you know, ostracize them or make them feel horrible or that I've got, you know, this this Western Jesus complex that I want to save them. Right. I, I mean, this is obviously a very uh, <laughs> heavy question. But I mean, the first thing is, the amount of ex-Muslims that are speaking publicly about being ex-Muslim is so few anyway. Mm-hmm. There's really very a very small amount from, from, from different places. And, and the thing is that there's not much that ex-Muslims are going to be able to do to make you feel more comfortable, to make you feel more at ease, because most ex-Muslims are going through such a difficult time mm-hmm. with their identity and who they are and the fact that they know that speaking out in public can can come with you know, loss of respect, loss of family, loss of income, potential violence, etc. So, you know, I don't think that they're that necessarily they'll be able to make you feel more comfortable to be able to ask those questions. But I think a lot of the times, you know, you have to also remember that ex Muslims are not kind of like exotic, interesting things. Like, you know what I mean? Sometimes right. I do feel that, you know, the way that I get asked questions, it's almost like I'm this this bizarre, this, this strange phenomenon that's happening. Yeah. But I think what well, you have to also <laughs> realize that there, that there are, I, th- I think, I think understanding that th- a person leaving Islam is a very, very old thing. People have been doing it for a very long time and realizing that there are kind of traditions of skepticisms in different Muslim communities will allow you to see that it's not so bizarre to have a person challenging Islam. It's just that the political climate that we have now has made it really, really difficult. So I think, you know, with, you know, you you said that you were at this conference and they didn't ask that many questions to them. Right. 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 What was that about, Paul? Was it that, you know, they weren't being asked that many questions about things generally? Because it might be that they'll look at an ex-Muslim and think that their only area of expertise is Islam. Right, right. You see what I mean? And, and and that comes from actually the fact that even though we've left Islam, we're still treated with the same racial stereotypes that affect Muslims. You know, we're still the same demographics. So just by leaving Islam doesn't necessarily make us more endearing or make us seem to be more 
you know, approachable. Does that make, does, does this make any sense? Oh, it totally makes so, sense. And you, yeah, you, you definitely, I could <laughs> feel what you were saying with the, uh, with the exotic nature of, of being face to face with an ex Muslim. <laughs> I mean, I think that captures, that captures it perfectly. For me, it really did. Um, at some point in the future on the show, uh, Ina and I are going to talk about my post conference experience that I had meeting a Saudi family after that conference. And, yeah. That was a huge growth opportunity for me. If I had never had that opportunity, and, and, and I had already been interviewing ex-Muslims for well over a year by that time, and still to have that face-to-face sit down with them was a huge growth opportunity for me. And so that's why I, I, I deliberately threw that at you because I wanted to hear mm-hmm. that back from you because I want to challenge us as well. I was, I almost, you know, watching that happen, I thought, you know, we've got Miriam up there. And then later on, we had Faisal up there. And, you know, I think Faisal had, I don't know, five questions, whereas there were certain other speakers that got up there. And they had a line of 30 or 40 people that were never going to be gotten to because we were going to run out of time before their questions could be asked. And I thought it was a lost opportunity mm-hmm. for 500 people. The fault of that lies with Western media, a lot of it. Because yeah, they they're, have, they're, 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 they do silence us and they, and, and they ignore yeah. us completely. Where challenging you know, Christianity is, you know, well, you know, well received, embraced, applauded even by respected. Western But challenging you know, Islam is... Uh, confrontational. Yeah. Yes, it's yeah. hushed. It's, you know, we're called bigots and we're not listened to, we're ignored, we're not given platforms as if we're like you know racist or something or or um or or was seen as people that are ashamed of our cultures right we can't which were which were not necessary you know i think i think and you know recently um we hosted uh faith to faith has hosted a panel at the at UCL a university in London and one of our speakers uh, Harry Parra he did a talk about leaving Hinduism mm-hmm. and one of the things that he said which really spoke to me as a Pakistani atheist was that this idea of how religion and nationality mix together yeah and I think a lot of kind of Pakistan like you know and this is why um I really really liked your book my cha-cha is gay Thanks. Um, and the reason why I liked it, because I'm like the reason why I loved it so much was because Pakistani people are gay. Like, like we have gay people. Oh, absolutely, right? we do. But we're not allowed to <laughs> like, talk about it. No, not to talk about it. But it's almost like when you leave Islam or when you challenge Islam, you're challenging what it means to be Pakistani. You're challenging your culture. You're challenging your community. And for many people who are outside, who are not Muslims, they respond in the same way to us as though we are now not part of that community anymore Mm -hmm. we don't fit into their community and we also don't fit into our community which like my you know my colleague mtrs he's always saying that it's important to stay rooted and to know that your culture is your culture and just because you left doesn't mean that you're not part of that anymore i mean uh, i wouldn't hold anyone to you know forcing culture on upon themselves a lot of things about culture bug me too culture and tradition and but there are certain aspects that are just um woven into the fabric of my existence and they'll never uh not be a part of me i can be ex-muslim but muslim will always be a part of my identity You know, like I'll suffer the problems that Muslims suffer. I'll suffer the bigotry, the profiling, the racism. Yeah, yeah, the tough time trap. Oh, (laughs) (laughs) but this is what I mean. This is I think you know when people say to me that I can't speak about Muslims or I can't speak about Islam or you know, you know, the 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 reason why it it, to me in a way just it I just kind of ignore it almost like it's a non-point is because I face the exact same demographical issues that they face. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the same levels of poverty, the same levels of discrimination. Yeah, okay, I don't wear a hijab anymore, but I wore it until the age of like 19. As if I don't know what it feels like to have people staring at me. Mm-hmm. Or as if I don't know what it feels like to have people looking at me like, oh, is she really oppressed? I wonder if her dad made her wear that. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I know that feeling. And then to be then told that now that you have an ideological change or you change the way that you think about God, now you're not a part of the community anymore. And that's why 
it is important for media outlets to 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 involve you know not just ex-muslim not just people who become atheists but you know people who are from all spectrums of of, of you know belief you know people are, you know i was speaking to a girl the other day who's who left islam and then she's become she's become a jew and she's really happy in it but they wouldn't invite someone like that on because they wouldn't even know how to begin with that identity. Right. I mean, they need to show that diversity. And I think that's what would help people like Paul feel more comfortable addressing these questions. Right. Right. Uh, because as yeah. a whole, it's uh, so taboo to be challenging Islam from any angle. So l- that- let me let me do challenge you now, Ina, and one one of the reasons why we agreed to do the show together was so we that we could manifest so these behaviors for other people so we could have these dialogues and and show other people how we can have this exchange i've got a question that i don't get that's not registering with me you just said okay. a couple minutes ago you said that you know the the cultural aspect and uh the mm-hmm. the the label muslim will always be part a little part of who i am now mm-hmm. from my perspective a Muslim is someone who subscribes to the religion Islam, just as a Christian is subscribes to Christianity. As an ex-Christian myself, I will never say the words that Christian is always going to be a little part of who I am. <laughs> I think the difference comes from being a minority and okay. not being a minority. Well, and that's what I wanted to explore. I wanted you to help me so, understand it so other like, people could understand it. My friends in Pakistan, uh, uh, several of them are atheists and they're also Shia, oh, but hmm. they take pride in their Shia identity, even though they despise religion. Wow. Because they're a persecuted minority within Pakistan, they'll go I- attend all the Shia events and do all the Shia things just out of, uh, you know, a cultural affiliation. <laughs> anything religious it's the same way maybe that someone celebrates christmas or that i celebrate eid with my family or whatever i mean these are uh, just things that we grew up with and if you're a persecuted minority uh you will probably identify more than uh, because you're challenged every step of the way you're told that this is wrong you're not okay you're uh not equal you're come from savages or whatever so that that is re- it, re- it really is. It's very interesting for me. Ali, do you have any kind of reaction to that yourself? Is is that a something you can relate to? Do you know? It's yeah. I I think with me with um with Islam, the reason why I obviously um you know I still study Islam. Um, I mean I'm looking at Islam at the moment from a much more historical. Um, point of view um, rather than a theological one and I think the reason why I've obviously remained so so close to Islam is 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 because it was such an important part of my life for so long it governed my life you know from the age of like five to the age of 20 years old um, so I don't think I'm going to be able to brush it off immediately but at the same time you know I can't escape it because my family is, you know, they they are Muslim. It's so it's so a part of their identity. You know, I'll give you an example, right? You know, you know, in Ramadan, the, the month when, when 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 Muslims fast, right? Now I've stopped fasting, and my family know I don't fast. And you know, in the morning, the breakfast, you know, they get up and they eat in the morning. I'm so cheeky that I get up and eat the breakfast, go back to sleep, but don't fast. <laughs> and uh, you know what I mean? So I wake up and I smell like the food cooking and I'm like, all right. And, you know, nobody bats an eyelid at the fact that I do that. I, I, I completely get away with it. And so I think in a way, I think if you can take, you know, if you can defang Islam, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Right. Take away the homophobia, take away the misogyny, take away the... The, the political sides of it, what are you left with? Stories, fables, some morals, a few, uh, you know, religious occasions. And, you know, there are, there, there are a lot of Muslims out there who follow Islam in that way. Islam has never been political for them and it never will be political for them. And, you know, it's something that you said, Paul, which I thought was interesting, which is your understanding that is that a Muslim is a person who does X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. Or prescribes to yeah, there are, is Islam, yeah. It prescribes Islam, right? <clears throat> but that has been a central issue for us for so long, is that you know, certain Muslims get told that they don't follow Islam properly and therefore they're not Muslims. Right. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? But there but there are so many people that, you know, they, they they don't follow Islam in any way that would ever make sense to you, to me, 
or to anyone else, but to them it does make sense, and they are Muslims, but they but they are the kinds of people who are going to be called apostates, or they're going to be called hypocrites, or they're going to be called outsiders, and I think opening it up and allowing people to have control over how much Islam they follow will will go a long way. Mm-hmm. And I think groups right. like you know, I, or whatever. I know. argue this with people all the time, uh, like. That that tell people off for being gay and Muslim, and I don't think that yeah. that's anyone else's business, really. I personally, yeah. intellectually, I don't understand myself how you can be gay and subscribe yeah. to a religion that wants you dead. Okay, whatever, but that's your business. I feel that that's like a baby step towards, um, I don't know, either questioning or reconciling somehow or ignoring certain bits, whatever you want to ignore about Islam, uh, you have my support. Ignore away. You know, the more we can ignore of it, the more I'll support you. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's an answer. I mean, you know, obviously it's not like a huge point, but I mean, you know, I used to also, you know, I, I never used to understand being gay and being Muslim until quite recently. And it, and to be honest with you, now it makes sort of perfect sense to me, whereas it never used to make sense to me. And I think the reason why was because I used to take Muhammad's sayings far too seriously mm-hmm. but people who you know may be gay and and remain muslims often don't and they usually only take mainly the quran seriously and the quran only ever mentions being gay once mm-hmm. and even then it doesn't even use the word sodomy for instance it just uses the word indecency which could mean a whole leverage leverage of things right. you yeah. see so i think in a way they, they, they can reconcile that but i think you know, people who are non-religious have to also not do what conservative people do to each other. Right, like which shove is, people in boxes. Right. Like you yeah. have to disbelieve or you have to do this. Yeah, or you're not really Muslim or, you know, you're intellectually defunct or you're, you know what I mean, or you're a hypocrite, whatever. Like, I think Give that people some is, space to question on their own terms. Yeah, you, you know, like we, you know, I, I, you know I, I, I've met people who, I get a lot of emails from, from Muslims and ex-Muslims. And I've been increasingly getting more emails from Muslim women recently. Yeah, tell me about this um, hijab video that, you know, it's brilliant that you you put it up on YouTube and yeah. I, the, the response has been, you know, phenomenal yeah. from it's what I hear. Awesome. Here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been quite interesting as well because uh, I always look at my likes and dislikes bar. And at the moment, it's about, th- it's, it's about 391 likes. 392 dislikes <laughs> so it's completely that's how, that's how you know <laughs> that's how you know that you know, there's there's a, I, i've done something well there exactly. but you're but, providing um, a resource that really you know there isn't really much of a uh, you know resources there's nothing this. really like that honestly i think oh. in a way i think when i well you know because i i struggled with my hijab for so many years i mean i i it, I, I had a really hard time with it and you know i I just started looking around me. I used to look on YouTube and every so often I just got into this really weird habit of just typing in, I'm taking off my hijab. I'm taking off my, I just kept, I just, kept, I just wanted to see if anybody was going to do it. And I just realized there was nothing on it. And I just thought, you know what, sod it, I'll do it myself. Mm-hmm. Um, and my colleague MTRZ just, you know, he, he just sat me down and helped me edit it. So I'm in massive debt to him. He just did it for me because I can't do anything with like computers. Me neither. And sounds familiar. <laughs> Uh, That's no, I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm not that bad. I just couldn't get my. I've just been really lazy. But <laughs> what I also said at the end of the video, which which was, you know, if you are struggling with it, then you know you can send me an email. And boy, did they listen to that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I've been getting emails every single week since October oh, when I wow. released it. Um, from and you know the funny thing is that there's this one particular girl who I speak to, and she is a Muslim, and we have never discussed Islam. Just the hijab. It's like nobody cares about it. Like I don't care about it. She doesn't care about it. And all we talk about is, you know, for her, it's the practicals of, okay, so when you took it off, how were your parents? How were their reactions? What should I say? What should I do? How should I do it? And we're going through strategies and game plans of ways for her to do it with the least kind of backlash. Mm-hmm. And, you know, th- that's why I said in my vi- my video, and, you know, I'm, I'm surprised I didn't get as uh, much criticism for it, which was that a lot of the times, you know, the fear of taking hijab off has like so little to do with God. You know, a lot of time women are so afraid of the social consequences of removing their hijab. I mean, often, you know, you get these, especially in the West, you know, you get these kind of pro hijab, you know, videos. Oh, yes. and yeah, yeah. yeah, well, you, you know, they're just like, you know, Essentially, what they say is, 
I like wearing a hijab. It makes me happy. And the women who don't want to wear it, you know, it's almost like they're a minority, but they're not a minority. Like, yeah, we don't have statistics because no one's doing our research for us. And no one's going to be honest about it. Even these women exactly. who are happy, I don't buy half of their stories. Of course, there are some, but I've known <laughs> some hijab activists who have in private confided to me that they were forced to wear it and they were upset about it and then they just got used to it. And now they have this public face of hijab is empowering. And I'm like, how can you, how can well, you Well, is that? that kind of, see, I mean, obviously I'm quite conflicted about that point in, in itself, which is that, because, you know, I did grow up around a lot of different women who wore it because I went to all these religious schools as well. I mean, I tons of hijabis mm-hmm. and niqabis. And I genuinely believe that there are some out there who do feel very comfortable and, and confident. Oh, yeah, in it. I, 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 bl- I believe you. Happy. But they feel they're supremacists. Yeah, they look well, down yeah, on other not, people. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think, I, th- I think that, uh, but I think that the hijab does that, like itself. Like I've always believed that the hijab is like an everyday uh, tool of gender segregation. It's like mm-hmm. a walking, talking Absolutely. gender segregation, right? And naturally, when you segregate people based on the assumption that you know, women are so gorgeous, men can't control themselves Mm -hmm. on the assumption that there are only two genders. You know, there's so many bizarre notions that come with just the hijab itself. I think it does create, you know, competition between women. Competition between, you know, you know, women who wear hijab are obviously put on a pedestal. Women who don't wear hijab are told, you know, one day hopefully you'll be like that. I mean, and for then instance, there's the you know wrong ways of wearing hijab and the horrible term yes, hijabi exactly. isn't hijabi. And then there's the niqabis who look down <laughs> on the hijabis, and it's well, just yeah. I mean, niqabis are a whole different ball game, though. Because, oh, believe me, I know. Uh, I, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, I see them it's very a whole differently. Different yeah, I mean, the thing about like and the thing is that the the, the the difficult thing about about wearing niqab is. You can't even really have access to women who wear niqab in order to even know how they feel or what they you think. You can't see their faces, so first of outside. all. You can't read I mean, their I mean, facial expressions. You can't approach them. They're separating themselves from society. So I, unless they're, I, I don't I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough to, um, obviously, because I, cause I, cause I wore the face veil. Right, you're an ex niqabi and it's funny. It's funny yeah. Uh, you know, I'm pretty vocal critic of the niqab so i wonder sometimes how that how <laughs> how you take it you know what the funny thing is i think the the only the only thing that stops me from being more vocal about niqab is the idea that i personally believe the niqab comes from a very 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 conservative place and i think challenging orthodoxy and conservative islam will will will, will ebb away niqab in the first place because niqab does nothing but separate women from society. Yeah. It puts them in it in, in it, it basically tells them that they only exist within a private sphere. Obviously, that like, you get the odd hijabi, or the, the odd niqabi, who might be part of the public sector. The only time that I have ever seen a niqabi on television is when they are having a conversation about the niqab. Right. And yeah, I've never why not seen just them do on radio t- then? Anything else. Well, do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah. So I obviously I don't I don't like the niqab. You know, I don't like the fact that I wore it. The fact that I wore it makes me feel sad. You know, I was such. You know, I I mean, I didn't wear just a niqab. I used to wear the black gloves as well. Wow. See, that's <laughs> you know, above and beyond. Me. Above and beyond the call of. And I was sixteen, and you have to ask yourself: Is a sixteen-year-old? You know, you know, a 16 year old who's told that she has to wear it according to God. Is that is that a free choice? Yeah, I mean, that choice element is always dubious. But even the women who think they're choosing it and they have this sort of niqab pride, they are upsetting to me in a way that uh, a KKK member in front in front of me would upset me in a hood you know do you think that's because you grew up in in saudi and because um you know because saudi society is so conservative do you think that that's why you've made that kind of that 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 connection between like the kkk and and, and the niqab because obviously as as somebody who wore it 
But I mean, even your example earlier was interesting because when you're connecting the extremism of Al-Huda and Niqab, you mentioned Mm. uh, neo-Nazis. So Mm. I think that... uh, I think that there is something there. I think think maybe it feels uncomfortable, but... There, I mean, because if, if you think about it, right? There, okay, I, mean, fine. I feel like there's a like a supremacy element to it because you're there is a supremacy them. element. You're, you're telling they, 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 everyone you're better than yeah. them because you're this pious, and uh, you're obviously so sexy that people would just die if they saw you, lust after you. Like, yeah, the kids see think your it's hands. Much more about yeah, but I think I, I think the niqab is much more about men. Like I've always said, if you want to understand. Niqab, all you have to do is look at the way that men teach it, the way that Islam teaches men about their own natures. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think part of what colors my views on the niqab is obviously growing up in a democratic <laughs> state like Saudi Arabia, where yeah. uh, veiling, not face veiling, but uh, headscarves and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the abaya, the cloak, were enforced. And by cane sometimes, like the morality police would walk around. So did you ever used to see that, actually? I saw it done to my mom, yeah, because her headscarf slipped. I mean, it's not like they take you into the center of the market square and, like, cane you. No, they're just walking around, tapping the ankles of women whose headscarves are falling. So, I mean, that traumatized me as a child. And, uh, like, I feel like I got away from that when we moved, but then I start seeing it infiltrate here and it makes me angry <laughs> no you know what it you know that's completely understandable and i think that's it why in a way like you know i think my hesitancy to you know if, like for instance i've never said that i support um a ban of the niqab and i still have not made up my mind about it i don't think i support you a blanket know. ban i just support like equal under the law so if i'm not allowed to wear a mask in court someone else shouldn't be allowed to no i agree with that that's, so I don't, that's, I mean, it's quite funny i had i had a really funny conversation with a niqabi on twitter ages ago and i was talking about a, 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 a niqab ban i think at that point i was going through a period of support in it and she was like she started you know questioning me and then i said to her you know, what do you think about me, about about the niqab ban? And she said, well, what do you think? Because obviously I wear it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, we ended up having a really normal conversation and, and everything was absolutely fine. And I think also with, you know, a lot of niqabis as well is sometimes it's got a lot less to do with kind of uh, necessarily judging other women. But I think it comes from a place where they they genuinely believe that this is the best sacrifice that they can make. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But not to mention the intimidation factor too, even to Muslims that are not that devout, uh, niqabs and hijabs can be intimidating. They don't like it. I mean, when, um, a family member of mine adopted niqab, there was a uproar in my family. Like my extended was so angry about it they hated it like I remember watching um because this when I'd come back from from al I didn't wear my niqab in London because oh. nobody made me and I was like it's cool I took it off right <laughs> and um literally I, I remember sitting there and you know she was wearing niqab and my uncle turned around and said to her I changed your diapers when you were a baby yeah. Nobody in our family wears this. Why are you wearing this thing? It, this, this is alien to us. Hmm. And she said no, and she kept it on. And you know, everyone was really offended and upset about it. It's but that's arrogant. the thing that, yeah. you know, people don't necessarily, you know, people have this idea that you know all societies, all Muslim communities, except niqab, but they don't. I mean, yeah, they don't. Absolutely, they, they don't. don't. Like in my family, everyone's against it, and not really a fan of the hijab either. Um, yeah, like my dad we has don't have, always yeah. spoken out against the hijab since I was a kid, and perhaps that also influences my views. So, I mean, when did you come back to to to? I mean, well, when did you leave Saudi? How old were you then? I was a teenager. No, so then in terms of intimidation, can you imagine if even people from within the culture 
are intimidated by it. I cannot imagine people from outside the culture, how they must feel when they're exposed to it and they don't really understand it. Uh, yeah. Of course, yeah. blatant bigotry and pulling headscarves off is horrendous and no one should uh, do that or support that. But there's uh, the question of awkwardness. Sometimes people are just awkward around hijabis. Like even um, I remember a friend of mine uh, tried to shake a hand in university of a hijabi girl and she just was like no like i'm not touching right. you and that's but, what i would have done yeah yeah <laughs> so i mean i and i i remember paul telling me something about having an experience with a hijabi right oh yeah i yeah that was that was a that growth opportunity that i had even after you know being exposed to uh ex-muslims for such a long time and still m getting a chance to meet somebody who i was going to interview um in secrecy, getting to meet his family and out on the streets of the city where we lived at, I knew what he looked like. I'd met him, but I didn't know what his family looked like. And when we, I went up with my family to have dinner with him, when I found out that his family was being invited along, there was some apprehension. And when we mapped out each other and found each other on the street, lo and behold, here, com here he comes with his, with his uh, cousins well, his cousin and his sister, um, his cousins got uh, got a beard. His name's Muhammad, and his sister is in the hijabi. And I can, to this day, or she's in the hijab, and I can, to this day, I can still re remember my reaction because I did a lot of reflecting afterwards. And Alia, like you said about how you're ashamed of how you felt previously, even mm -hmm. this has been a, almost a year later now, and I still feel that shame of how I reacted to her, and it was like instinctual. It was... Holy crap. I, I don't want to be here. I'm incredibly uncomfortable. I'm an atheist. He knows I'm an atheist, even though I knew he was. It was just this jumble of I instant reaction to it. Well, instant. what made you feel uncomfortable? Was it because the thing is that in, in Britain, especially if you live somewhere like London, mm -hmm. that we are, this is a multicultural, like, boiling pot, and I love it, right? Right. Mm. right. That's what Toronto's like. Too. You know, the, yeah, there are so many different. Like, there are so many Muslims here as well, and I think most most British people, in especially if you live somewhere like much more cosmopolitan like London, they're so used to Muslims that they don't know, they, they they might not necessarily be that that kind of have that instant reaction. So was it for you that that you hadn't actually spent a lot of time around Muslim, and it was that you've heard so much about Muslims, you've seen so much about them online, and now you're finally meeting one. It's like, oh, what do I do? Yeah, exactly what it was, because I grew up in a small farm town in upstate New York, so nowhere near New York City where I would have been exposed mm -hmm. to it. And then uh, and then I joined the military, and, and Ina knows this. I've talked to her uh, on a mm -hmm. number of occasions. So my only exposure, and, and the places I lived in the military were, you know, in the Midwest and in Germany. Um, so... At, at the time I lived in Germany, the Muslims that did live in Germany didn't present. Uh, they tried to assimilate, if you will, into the German culture. So you didn't see, at that time, you didn't see women wearing the hijab out in public. So I didn't have any exposure except for when I went to Qatar and Iraq. And I wasn't going there as a tourist. I was going there as a military person. And the, the folks that I did see, there's that unspoken tension, even if we're supposedly all, even if m me and the Iraqis are working towards the same goal of democracy for the Iraqi people, mm -hmm. there's that unspoken but tension, that, right? So mm -hmm. I always had that, that mm -hmm. connection, hijab. That makes me think of something. Go ahead. That, 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 that does make me wonder something. I mean, um, you know, how, how, I mean, how widespread do you think this kind of, not understanding Muslims, seeing them as kind of like a bizarre other. How 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 prominent would you think that is within within the American military? Oh, it's, from your yeah. experience, it's, it's it's very prominent, very prominent. And there's as I grow have grown over these last three years of doing the podcast, looking back on those experiences in the military, I <laughs> have a severe distaste that will live with me until I die from things I heard and things mm -hmm. I said as a, my, as a person myself about Muslims while I was in the military. There is a perception. I was, I'll give you a quick anecdotal. I was at a, at a certain training event. I won't say what it was, but it's a leadership 
training. Th this is people who will be leading American troops. And um, it was back early in the, uh, in the second Iraq war, early on in that. And we were, getting, we're, we were being given a video to lead into this, this general speech that he was going to give us. The video was from a, um, from a plane that was, you know, had the infrared uh, video and it was showing it dropping bombs on certain hideouts. And there's a lot of people who will hear this will be that will be disgusted by the reaction in that room. It was so you mentioned earlier about the dehumanization, the depersonalization of people. That's exact. Those were not human beings mm -hmm. that we were seeing being killed. Mm -hmm. They were I mean, they were Muslims by name, but they were this thing, this other thing that was not human. Some and I there were comments about jokingly jovial comments about body parts being flung all over the place as if this was not a human life now after 20 years in the military i understand the necessity of war and i'll put air quotes on that but looking back on those type of comments if that if we took that video and we put it in central park in new york city and those were americans being blown all over the place i highly doubt the comments would have arrived, you know would have compared to what i heard there it's very prominent yeah yeah, see, and see, and see, that is, see, a lot of this kind of, you know, bigotry of Muslims and hatred of Muslims makes our life so difficult, like in so many ways, yeah. because, I mean, we get told, especially ex-Muslims, right? We get told that, you know, why can't Muslims just, you know, get with it? Why can't they just move on? And why can't they just, you know, reform their religion and do it right now, Right. But then you do have this kind of a double standard where, you know, people look at Muslim communities and say, you guys are so backwards, you guys are so ignorant. But I mean, the the, the, the ignorance towards, you know, different communities, different ethnicities from, you know, parts of the Western world is also quite staggering. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? And I think see, these kind of conversations between, you know, ex-Muslims and obviously someone who was part of the military these are really important things to happen Absolutely. because we need to get that we need to i think what's everything that you've just said is is kind of a bit similar to you know what what we do which is we bring the you know the the dirt and the wounds of our communities to the surface so we can deal with it right you see and i think that is also something that, that of course you know non-muslim societies have to also look at as well which is you know when you look at Muslim communities, what do you see? I mean, do you, do you see people that are struggling with, 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 with a lot of issues or do you just see people that are, in, are, are inherently bad? And that's why I have, I have such a problem with anyone calling it Islam a disease because if you're calling Islam a disease, you're saying that it's almost like it, it, it's beneath the skin and then, and, and then it does border on racism. Yeah, it's not what inherent I mean, but... in anyone. It's not like you can catch it and not all have the same symptoms. It's... No, Different. but I mean, I mean that, that's what the conservative Muslims say, don't right. they? Which is you're born a Muslim and you die a Muslim. So yeah. in a way, it's it's two sides of the same coin. It um, is. And, and it is difficult. And I think, you know, obviously, I mean, I've, I've only started um, getting involved, you know, being public for the last year. I mean, a year ago, I I was completely out of the loop in a way. I didn't get involved in politics, um, and 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 I, and I suppose in a way I got dragged into it because there was this thing happening with you know you know religious schools, and I just you know I felt like I had to get my my side out there. Mm -hmm. But I think you know I deal with so many ex-Muslims on in in so many levels. I mean. I get emails and messages from young ex-Muslims. And in London, I mean, London is becoming a real hub of ex-Muslims. Like, yeah. a real hub. Like, there are so many here. And there are networks that are being created. And the funny thing is that I think more and more and more Muslims are becoming fundamentally more aware of ex-Muslims than they were, let's say, five or six years ago. Would you say that's true? Do you think there's been much more of a kind of awareness about Definitely. the fact that ex-Muslims exist? Yeah, because we're out there and speaking more, I think, and more and more people are more comfortable to uh, join in and speak up as well. 
Uh, to some yeah. extent, it's happening. There's like some tiny bits of recognition in mainstream media. And if we just yeah, keep I mean, going. I, I saw yours recently as well, which was brilliant. Um, it was in like mainstream Canadian. Yeah, on the CBC. That was uh, really. That was incredible. It was a win because Canadian uh, liberal media has generally just been very uh, bad at covering Muslim issues and uh, just being an apologist for everything to do with Islam. So I'm really, really glad that they listen to me. A lot of times they bump me off their shows. Uh, so once they hear that I'm ex Muslim, like they'll do the pre interview with me and then they'll be like, Oh, we'll get back to you and set it up. And they'll be like, Oh, our show has been restructured. Sorry about that. Yeah. I've had a few of those as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I have an event coming up soon in um, January, uh, which is going to be a panel, but of only ex-Muslim women. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there'll be, I think there'll be five of us on, on the panel. And, you know, people are asking me that, you know, why did you kind of limit it to only ex-Muslim women? And why did you exclude men? And I was just like, well, because <laughs> ex-Muslim women are so silenced mm-hmm. that, you know, I, we need to create a space for them just to have a conversation without anyone butting in. Yeah. And, you know, just to have that space. But it was interesting as well that some of the most vocal ex-Muslims that we have are women. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. look at Mariam Namazi, for instance. Definitely. You know, she's one of the most prominent ex-Muslims in the world. And, mm-hmm. she, and she's a woman. And I think it's because Islam has does have a long history of treating women badly. And I think yeah. that this question of, of women's rights is, is, is so central to a lot of antagonism that's directed towards Muslims as well mm-hmm. you know people don't understand it and they just say oh Muslim men treat women badly well it's and, so visible you know, too right that they you you can people get visual cues of women being treated badly and they just uh, they just jump to generalizations from those visual like they'll see a lot of hijabis maybe one day or, or a couple of niqabis and they'll generalize it to the larger population yeah. Um, but that is because those visual symbols exist within our communities to a great extent and a growing extent. Yeah, I know. And I mean, I think that's in why, in a way, a lot of a lot of the work that I do and, and the thing is that it's quite slow work. I mean, a lot of the oh, times what slow. I do is it's so slow. I mean, for instance, you know, I, I'm i doing like backwards, you know, emails going backwards and forwards between me and and these and these women and these and these young women and a lot of the times, you know, it's the same question over and over again, which is, how do I do it? How do I do it? How do I do it? Well, yeah, just do keep I do it? And doing I think, it. <laughs> keep doing it. And the only way I think <laughs> that I would say the only way that women are going to be able to do it is to actually have courage. Like that's the only thing that they can do is to have that courage. But they need a support network as well. Like you know, no one's really, you know, no one's really working on this in in a real systematic way because it's been downplayed for so long as a non-issue or more and more of these you know girls will come out i think i I think i think we'll see in the next you know five to six years i think we'll see a lot more ex-muslim voices i'm looking forward to hearing them whoever they are whoever they're going to be yeah but i'm i'm pretty confident that 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 it it will happen it's i mean it's in motion now uh it started and i think (laughs) i don't know if you saw that I don't know if you saw that guy. He's like an a, a ex-Muslim comedian, and and he uh, he did a, a parody video of Zakir Naik. No, I didn't see that. Oh my goodness, it's hilarious. It's 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 on my Twitter. It is the funniest thing, and the reason why it's so important is because I've been waiting for some 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 comedy, some satire to come out from inside. Yeah. About about these things, I think once. Once the comedy starts hitting, once the satire, once people can make fun out of it, that will really bring in the motion of actually challenging ideas. When, when you know, when you can laugh at something, of course. you're not scared yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah, I think that you're doing some wonderful work, and I think that you should just keep going. Yes. No, I you agree. too. I mean, I, I mean, I obviously respect both of what you're doing. It's been a pleasure chatting, and uh, we'll link to your Twitter and your Faith to Faith Faithless. And is there anything else that you wanted to? Um, no, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you for 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 listening. And uh, yeah, if uh, say like I always say, if you're kind of a young ex-Muslim or or a hijabi or something, you can drop me a message as well. That's what we do. Excellent. So, yeah, it's been great.
again, Ina and I, thank you for downloading. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for getting the word out there about this show. There's a number of interviews that we will be doing in the future that we've already got lined up. And as the show gets more and more attention, I imagine we'll have more and more of those. We are going to try to find out what in the world is going on with YouTube and how we can get around that while also getting this out to as many people as possible. So that's why we're sending you either to the SoundCloud or to the QRSS feeds to get this show in your hands. Thank you again for downloading and listening. You've been listening to Polite Conversations with Ina and Paul. Thank you for downloading and listening to us. If you'd like to hear more of the show's content, head over to YouTube and find us by searching for Polite Conversations Podcast. You can find the wonderful host, Ina, on Twitter, at Nice Mangoes. No E in mangoes now. And you can find me, her illustrious co-host, Paul Sading, on Twitter as well, at The Q Podcast or at AAP Podcast Show. You can also reach me on Facebook by heading over to facebook.com.